Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our fifth Enlightenment Salon. And this is a favorable coincidence. We have five participants in our fifth Enlightenment four four. Salon. Yes. And in order, uh, John Marietta, Bobby Rich, uh, James Cohagen, Bill Andrews, and Janati Stolyarov II. Welcome to everybody. Now, three of us, James, Bill, and I, were present at RadFest 2018 in San Diego, California. This event occurred from September 20th to the 23rd. Bill and I were both speakers at RadFest, and this was an event to essentially share information about the latest developments in science, activism, and the public discourse on longevity. So I'm curious as to your impressions of RadFest, Bill, given that you were one of the uh, highlighted speakers and also uh, you're one of the organizers of the event. What are your thoughts? Well, now you bias me. I do believe that RadFest is the absolute best conference. And I don't like calling it a conference because it's actually a festival. It's the best place for anybody to go and learn everything they can about staying young and healthy as long as possible. It's got the world's greatest experts. Every, you know, we handpick who the speakers are. We make every effort possible to keep the charlatans out. So almost every speaker, and I want to say we make mistakes sometimes, so not all of them come across as being uh, authentic, but uh, we have probably the best set of speakers on the planet for for knowing every aspect of how to beat death. Excellent. And James, um, I was very impressed with uh, with a lot of the speakers, some of the Brad City sponsors and such. Not as much after investigating, but the speakers and the science was solid, and I really enjoyed that. Um, especially. I believe it was the third day where who was the lady who had the her telomeres extended? Liz Parrish. Liz Parrish. I especially liked um, her presentation with that, and I learned a lot behind the scenes talking with these people, like <clears throat> the Descends Research Foundations, how their projects are going. Yes, indeed, the Descends Research Foundation had a booth at the Rad City Expo for the first time as did a lot of other new biotechnology startups. Uh, for instance, i uh, Biotherapeutics was there for the first year, and they are essentially a spin-off from the SENS research program, but they're doing research into macular degeneration. They've raised, I think, around $20 million already, and they're just one example. Aubrey de Grey gave a speech that describe some of the emerging startups and the areas of research they're specializing in. And it's interesting how Aubrey runs a philanthropic organization. Essentially, the Sense Research Foundation is a research charity. They fund basic research and they fund intermediate research that often gets neglected in academia, but that private investors don't always want to put money into because there's not an immediate return. But now a lot of these research areas are emerging into uh, that stage where now some entrepreneurs think hmm, there's a promising business opportunity there. So hopefully that will continue to expand. And Bill, during your presentation, you discussed how you've been diligently working over the past year on developing essentially a safety protocol for the gene therapy trials with Labella Gene Therapeutics and how you've managed to <clears throat> essentially forestall or prevent the key failure points that could arise for patients. Yeah, no, it's, it's been a lot of work um, because a lot of mice have been treated with gene therapies, a lot of humans have been treated with gene therapies, everybody presents it as a very safe thing to do, but when you read the fine print you find out that a lot of these people and animals got sick from immune responses, most notably the cytotoxic T cell response. Uh, now that can kill a person, and I'm sure a lot of mice died from the cytotoxic T cell response, but 
they, you know, they don't report those. Uh, so, but I became really aware that we have to, and the clinical study that Odell is doing, uh, has have to really figure out a way to overcome this potential immune response. Uh, and so I spent months researching everything I could, talking to the world's leaders in immune uh, treatments, uh, and then attended a conference on immuno, on, on gene therapy, and talked to the experts there. And during all this time, I, I learned of a way that actually looks like it's working. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I'm not at liberty yet to describe that because I would be in breach of contract with Rubella, uh, but I'm very excited about the fact that uh, we have a protocol that we believe will completely eliminate any uh, immune responses that uh, anybody might get during the treatment. And that's really the only side effect that's ever been uh, concern, of concern to anybody because uh, telomerase has been shown to be safe in all animal studies. The gene therapy has been, the gene therapy vector has been shown to be safe, except for the immune responses. No, no animal or humans de ever developed an immune response against telomerase since it's already protein found inside of us. Uh, and uh, so I'm very optimistic. So as soon as I decided one day to, to declare that I have, I'm done figuring out how to do it and we can proceed, then it's all become in terms of talking to governments in various countries about getting regulatory approval. Now, we can be like a lot of other people and just go to Mexico or somewhere and do a <laughs> clinical study without any approval or something like that, but uh, we won't do that. Um, and I've insisted that Bella better not do that. Uh, but I'm, I'm totally opposed to it. They're totally opposed to it. So we're actually going through every country, including the United States. Uh, we're actually working with the United States through this new program called RMAT, or M-A-T, which is uh, designed uh, for special uh, privileges, I guess, for getting approvals and getting approvals to do clinical studies using gene therapy. Um, but uh, the countries that are actually moving the fastest are Colombia, Malaysia, Singapore, and uh, Tokyo. And uh, uh, so our first studies might be there. I just spent, I just returned last week. So after RedFest, I returned from Bucaramanga, Colombia, where I met with the Medical Review Board of Colombia uh, to, to go over the clinical protocol that we had submitted for approval. It turned out they had a bunch of questions. They didn't understand everything. I had to go down and explain. I spent eight hours in front of the board uh, explaining everything, but they were very happy with everything. And Unfortunately, because they only have medical review boards every few months, uh, as a result of that delay, uh, we won't be able to treat our first patient on December 10th, as I announced in the Radfest. That new date is now January 15th. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> our first patient is a 76-year-old person who's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's five and a half years ago, now it's been five years and uh, six months ago, <laughs> or seven months ago. Um, so, um, uh, the sooner this person gets treated, the better. Uh, the clinical study will be focused uh, primarily on treating Alzheimer's. Uh, and uh, but we're, because the clinical study is going to be so expensive, uh, we're going to try to get every marker measured possible. And, you know, uh, you mentioned at Rad City, uh, there were some things that you didn't exactly like about Rad City. But I did meet a very interesting doctor. Um, at, in Rad City, uh, Dr. Sandra Kaufman, who actually wrote a book. I, care, I talked yeah. to her. She wrote a book called The Kaufman Protocol. And <clears throat> after reading that book, I was so amazed at how well she's understood and got an, everything together that we've now asked her to be a co-investigator on the study. And she's also going to be in charge of designing all the uh, biomarkers that we're going to be measured to make certain we don't leave any stone unturned. So I'm very excited about that. Um, but the, uh, uh, trying to think of anything new, right now, uh, we don't know exactly where. Vanuatu Island is also a place that might uh, occur, uh, clinical study might occur, um, but we don't know, it depends on which government comes first, but we're ready to go as soon as somebody approves it. We've got the hospitals all set up, we've got everything else set up, um, all we need is the governments to say, go for it, and we get our first person treated where that will actually be, we don't know, but we're right now scheduled for January 15th. Well, I hope you 
get at least one of those governments to approve the trial quickly. And I'm glad to hear that there has been progress. Now, you mentioned the RMAT process in the United States, and because this is also an event for the U.S. Transhumanist Party, we are interested in the regulatory and policy developments that could perhaps streamline uh, some of the approval processes for clinical trials. Uh, what have been your impressions of the RMAT program? I, I'm actually, that's not my part, of, so I'm focused on science. Uh, I've been, I know that the other people in Labella have been really focusing on getting the RMAP process going through. I hope that uh, um, BioViva is going through RMAP. I also hope that Telocyte, uh, run by Mike Fossil, is going through uh, RMAP, because I think that's going to be a benefit to everybody. And, and it's, it's not a race. It's We all need to be curing our own aging, so I'm just hoping somebody can do something really fast. Yes, that, that's the key, that some breakthroughs are made. It's not as important who makes them as long as they're made available for the benefit of human beings, hopefully in time for as many of us as possible. The unfortunate part is that gene therapy will never be cheap. Uh, so at first only the super wealthy would be able to afford it. But I'm looking at it as a uh, proof of concept to justify doing further research to develop other means of inducing telomerase to lengthen telomeres. And I believe we can get that cost down to 10 cents a dose. Uh, at least at our cost to produce it at 10 cents a dose uh, within the next three to five years. That would be amazing. Yeah. I'm a bit, cons I'm, I'm a bit um, confused about that because part of the reason gene therapy has been so widespread in recent years is because of CRISPR protocol. And <clears throat> part of the reason CRISPR is so amazing is because of how cheap it is at being, last I checked, $49 per. So. How well, is that? You, but, okay, so for, first of all, let me say, CRISPR is not the first gene uh, I, I know editing it's thing. It's, it's uh, Sangamon has had zinc fingers going on for 25 years, and there's also talons, but they're all fairly inexpensive to treat cells in a petri dish. And so you can buy kits to treat things, but if you want to treat every cell of your body, that's going to be a major obstacle, and nobody has really figured out how to do that yet. Uh, they, they are experimenting with, uh, Sangamon has been doing for a long time, experimenting with the same gene therapy that we are called admin associated virus. Um, and, uh, uh, but it's still, it's, it's very expensive to produce enough of this gene therapy to deliver to every cell of the body. Uh, and even when you only deliver to the one tissue of the body, it's still super expensive. Mm -hmm. Just producing, just producing the, the gene therapy in its own in the bioreactor is super expensive. Now, one of the individuals we've mentioned already in this conversation is Liz Parrish. She was a presenter at RadFest, and Bobby and John, you had an opportunity to interview her recently. Uh, I know that you'll be publishing the video of the interview on your channel, Science-Based Species, but what can our viewers look forward to in that interview? Um, yeah, uh, I thought it was a great interview. Um, she's so awesome to talk to. Uh, and she, she discussed uh, some of those promising uh, treatments uh, that she has right now that her company is doing, and uh, we uh, that she got she got very passionate about um, extending lifespan, and uh, but also not only reversing aging but helping uh, children, uh, uh, curing their diseases, and um, uh, yeah, it, I definitely look forward to publishing it and. Um, there's some great information in there, uh, and we talked a little bit about Radfest. And um, John and I couldn't make it to Radfest this year, but we're certainly going to be there next year. Um, and she also uh, talked about how how great Radfest is because uh, it's not just they have some of the best scientists and people working on uh, extending lifespan, but uh, the audience members are very uh, receptive. Uh, they, they understand this technology very well, so I think Radfest would be great for uh, lay people to go to because um, even if you didn't have a chance to talk to one of the experts, there's plenty of people to talk to that uh, know what they're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, it, was, it was really nice to be able to talk with her about uh, the kind of research that her company does and the things they do. But uh, 
we I got off topic on a thing I just want to mention. I think I might have mentioned it before, but I can go to it in fuller detail. Is we were talking about epidural stimulators, and that's the looks to be the next big thing for spinal cord injury. I was at my physical therapy the other day, and the guy who I worked with just finished working, doing a workshop in the University of Louisville uh, in Kentucky. And he actually got a training on this new technology and what it's going to be like. And they say it's pretty much the next big thing for spinal cord injury. They started this research in 2011, and it's essentially a, like a little like pacemaker almost, like a TENS unit, it goes on the spine where the injury site is, where the scar tissue is. It sends a little bit of millivolt, and that allows the signal to transduce and have the person move his foot. They were only going to do it for pain killing, because a lot of times you get chronic pain neuropathy, but they found people were actually able to restore voluntary movement. It's very simple right now. We got moving a leg, uh, engaging trunk muscles, standing. We aren't walking yet, but it's a, uh, it's a through more research and through more funding, we're going to definitely have a means to get people walking again. And that's very promising because it's very tangible, it's very real. And I guess this parish is working with people um, who have spinal cord injuries. Yeah, I guess so. Some, we sent her a few links. Yeah, one of the uh, persons on our board, I guess, is in a, might be a para. Uh, 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 and it's, so it's, what's really cool about this, package. yeah, the really cool thing about this device is it's already been FDA approved for pain. So they, but, but again, it goes in your body, so it's a little risky to surgery, anything, but it's pretty low risk. But what the greatest thing they're finding out now is that they don't even have to put it on the, the dura, they can put it on your back and send the signals through that way. And that will actually start to do it. And they do you with training. And the most craziest thing, I have to pay read it again, but I read it four times because it just was so crazy, is that with four months of training with the shock on your back, uh, your brain creates new neural networks, and now you no longer even need the shocker anymore. Now you can walk, so or move your legs right now. But it's what's really cool is that here uh, is it's kind of like a pacemaker for people with heart problems, or like a insulin pump for people who have diabetes. But it's a it's like a it's an electrode. It's a stimulator for your spine, and it's restoring people's ability to walk, and not just walk. Uh, they're having better control of their blood pressure, better control of their temperature, bowel, bladder, sexual function, you know. All, all this great stuff is coming back. And it's a, uh, it's really uh, something I've been very passionate about. Or this thing that Liz said, I'm gonna ask her if I can patent it, is that it's only fair that we get you out of that chair. <laughs> yeah, um, we're, we're hoping that in our YouTube channel, maybe like the 50th video or 90th video, uh, John is walking again. So he'll start yeah. in his chair, then, uh, then he'll be able to walk. So yeah, that'll, that'll, that'll be, be great. Fun. I've been working with Liz Parrish for, I'd say, six, seven years now. I think she's one of the most resourceful people I've ever met. She's really making things happen. I think the future is going to be a, a lot better place because of the effort she's doing. So yeah. I'm really looking forward to seeing what she and BioVita pull off. Yes. Actually, at the last RadFest, I was privy to a conversation between Liz and Zoltan Istvan, the founder and former chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party, uh, and at the time he was uh, just there as a speaker providing some historical context for his presidential campaign, but there was a reception afterward, and Liz and Zoltan were speaking, and they're both extremely genuine people uh, about their view that aging, disease, involuntary death need to be defeated within our lifetimes. And they were also expressing frustration as to why hasn't the general culture caught on to this yet. Uh, they pointed out that from their individual backgrounds, uh, they're not, let, let's say, the most distinguished of experts. Liz Parrish uh, is a mother who became concerned about the way the medical system treats children with chronic conditions. And so she got into the activism and she got into the science. She attended a lot of sentence conferences and she became one of the leading voices for life extension advocacy in the world. And Zoltan started as 
a journalist, he read a lot of philosophy books, he traveled throughout the world, he was in a lot of conflict zones, and he nearly stepped on a landmine in Vietnam. And when he had that near-death experience, he essentially realized that uh, he could have almost lost everything. And that really impelled him to realign his priorities and devote much of uh, his life from that point to date to promoting transhumanism and life extension and trying to change cultural perceptions. So uh, the way they spoke to one another, and I just happened to be an onlooker, uh, really drove home the point that these are two people who consider themselves uh, at least to be of fairly ordinary backgrounds, but through the realization of the importance of these endeavors, they became leading advocates, and I think that's a lesson to everyone watching this, that you too can become a leading advocate for this movement. Just educate yourself, be aware of the latest developments, and communicate to people in a way that they can relate to, that these are the most important causes of our era. So along the lines of longevity, uh, earlier in this uh, discussion before we turned on the camera, we were talking about long-lived organisms. And there are various long-lived plants and animals. And they have some similarities, but also some dissimilarities to humans. And Bill, you had mentioned that, uh, for instance, jellyfish and long-lived trees have some significant dissimilarities to humans and other mammals. Yeah, well, jellyfish are actually really not one organism. They're actually a mixture of organisms. They're, you can break off a piece of a jellyfish and that will form a new jellyfish. Uh, it, it's, it's, humans aren't like that. Okay, so, so that anybody trying to figure out a way to extend lifespan in humans by mimicking the jellyfish is not going to get anywhere because we are not jellyfish. Um, but the same is true for like trees, like the bristlecone pines and things like that. They talk about how these trees are like 2,000 years old, but when you go look at the tree, you see one branch way up high that's alive. The rest of the tree is dead as a doornail. I don't think we want to be considering ourselves alive if one of our fingers is alive and the rest of us is dead. So <clears throat> those kind of things that are allowing those jellyfish and trees to live longer are not something that's going to really benefit humans, as far as I can tell. Something could surprise me. Uh, but I do think that as a species closer to humans, are going to be providing some information um, and, and getting a little bit closer there's there's we now know that lobsters and clams uh, humpback whales tortoises uh, some birds and some fish they all have no detectable aging process um, people never started asking how long animals live until the time of darwin about 150 years ago if i keep doing my math right uh, and now some are finding that you know the only way to tell how old an organism is is to find it when it's first born, put it into a cage or an aquarium, and watch it. Well, some of these animals, 150 later, years later, are still no sh showing no signs of aging. Uh, and uh, the thing that I like about that is that they they've been shown all these animals have been shown to have telomerase produced in all their cells. Uh, their telomeres don't get shorter. Uh, they have no detectable aging, and they rarely get cancer and other diseases. Uh, and so it's, it's suggesting that lengthening telomeres, the thing I'm trying to do with humans, is got a lot of um, optimism for believing that it's going to really be good for humans. Um, now, I did say that you can't tell how old an animal is unless you are there when it's born, but, because they don't have rings on a tree like trees do. <clears throat> but clams actually do have something like that. Every year, a clam gets a new stripe on its shell, and now people have found clams that are over 500 years old, and it's all because their telomeres don't get shorter because of the telomeres are produced. Uh, and uh, so, so yeah, we aren't all like. In fact, getting even closer to humans, uh, when we start looking at mice and stuff, we find out that mice really aren't very, very similar to humans at all in terms of aging. One of the most remarkable studies that I've ever seen has been reproduced several times 20, 25 years ago, is that <clears throat> when you take mouse cells and human cells and grow them in a petri dish, they both reach what's called the Hayflick limit, or called senescence. 
But in the mouse cells, you can overcome that senescence with antioxidants. When you try treating with the telomerase, the length of the telomeres, it has no effect. The cells still go into senescence at the hippo point. Humans are the other way around. When you treat with antioxidants, it has no effect. Uh, they still level off and go into senescence. But if you treat with telomerase, the length of telomeres, it obliterates the hay flip on it. The cells just never enter senescence. Um, this is a major difference between my, mice and humans, which makes me wonder how much mouse data is really good for humans. And so if we start doing uh, animal studies more than what we did when I was at Geron Corporation, uh, we would probably start using a uh, primate. Uh, most primates have been shown to age like humans. In fact, I should mention that of all the animals that have been tested at University of Texas Southwestern, uh, the only animals that have been shown to age like humans are, are dogs, cats, horses, sheep, pig, and deer, and also other uh, non-human primates and engineered mice. Uh, engineered mice like what Ron DePino used in his mouse studies. All the other animals, they don't age like humans. They have some other aging process going on. Um, and uh, so, so, so I'm looking, like because of the fact that our research with the uh, gene therapy is so expensive, I'm looking, I've been, I spent a lot of time looking for what's the smallest primate in the world. And I found out that that small primate is called Madame Bertha's mouse lemur. And it's only found in Madagascar. Uh, so I've already been in contact with officials and, and other scientists in Madagascar to start doing studies on this. But this primate, full grown, is the size of a human thumb. In fact, there's a very famous picture of uh, uh, what's it, Shaquille O'Neal uh, sitting there with a, one of these primates in his hand, and the primate's just barely the size of his thumb. Um, so it's, uh, but that would that would be that would allow us to do. Uh, studies on aging in an animal model that an animal that ages like humans do that wouldn't cost the absorbent amounts of money that gene therapy does. Um, I would be concerned because at least for mice as soon as the studies or stuff they're affiliated with unless there's a continuum they're put down afterwards I would be concerned about what would be the fate of these primates well, after. So am I. Okay and I'm glad you said that because I am one of the reasons we don't do animal studies in Sierra Sciences is I just cannot stand the fact that animals are just put down afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was doing research, psychological research, at the University of California, San Diego, we were given rabbits and pigeons and things like that to study. We were told that at the end of the experiments, all the animals had to be exterminated. Well, you can believe me, I did a midnight raid and, and rescued my animals and took them home with me. <laughs> but the, uh, and that's the first time I ever confessed to that, so I hope UC San Diego doesn't throw me in jail for doing that. Uh, but apparently it was the law. Yes, um, but in, the, in, the, in the, all the conversations I've been having with people in Madagascar and stuff, I've been saying I would like to use uh, lemurs or primates that are pets in people's homes. Okay, And I would like to go to that home treat the pet and let them watch it, let the pet run around, just keep track of it, things like that. I do not want to see any harm there. I, I don't believe in harm. Nobody should ever get harm in trying to develop the treatment. Because if, you, if that's not an issue to you, then you're only interested in the money. Uh, so but that's, that's what so I, I'm hoping that we can set up a study like that where the animals benefit tremendously from the treatment. I agree with you completely, Bill. I think the law requiring experimental animals to be destroyed after the conclusion of the experiment needs to be repealed and indeed the transhumanist party in its platform is opposed to the euthanasia of healthy non-contagious non-dangerous animals especially if a trial is investigating lifespan and effects of particular treatments on aging, one would think one would want to keep these animals alive for as long as possible because setting some, setting some artificial cutoff for the trial would defeat the purpose. If you're actually successful in extending lifespan, but your trial is only up to X months, you don't know how successful you've been unless you let those animals survive as long as they would have survived without your intervention. I'm also a big believer in compassionate use. So even if you have a placebo control, 
as soon as you see that the experimental samples are working, you treat the placebo too. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Half the people just get screwed. And they yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of clinical studies where that is the routine right now. When as soon okay. as the drug starts to show to be effective, the placebo group is treated too. Okay. At no cost to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it is very difficult to perform a precise controlled experiment with humans anyway, but we have to keep the goals of the experiment in mind. And if the goals are not just to find out knowledge, but to achieve an effect, improvements in health or saving someone's life, then yes, compassionate use should be the default practice. So I also wanted to uh, ask you, James, you perform studies in crayfish populations. Yeah. Uh, could you discuss your research a bit? Um, most of it's preliminary watching data because, believe it or not, there's not a lot of data on crayfish and the stuff there is is mostly centered in Europe and even that's sparse and scattered. There's an occasional thing or migration patterns but very few population studies. So there's actually not a lot known about them. Like, there's distributions and things and where they're supposed to be and where they're not, but it's a very unknown creature, despite it being in both common use and culinary practice and scattered all over the globe. So what I'm doing is just a plain population study for just a baseline. I'm taking measurements of water quality, average length, average, um, uh, average weight, and of course weighing each of them, and then the whole population size and seeing if anyone wants to go from there or just continue my work on to my graduate studies. How much is known about the lifespans of crayfish? I was just I don't know. I, I, I've looked it up. There is, and there probably is somewhere, but I have not seen a single reference to their age online. Well, if they're at all related to lobsters, and you're interested, I would love to do a collaboration with you. If you can provide us some tissues without hurting the crayfish, provide us some tissues that we can culture cells from. We can do things like measure telomerase activity, measure telomere lengths, uh, find out if they ever reach a hay flip limit. Um, <clears throat> just because lobsters don't reach a hay flip limit, they have telomeres produced in all their cells, they have no telomere shortening. If crayfish are anything like lobsters, that would be that would be a very interesting find. I can bring you some lunch ones if you want. Yeah, I, I don't know if we have somebody right now that could acquire the tissue from without hurting the animal. Um, but uh, I don't want to pull off a leg, <laughs> and uh, I, I don't like that. Um, but the, uh, if there's some way that you know of somebody who knows how to stick a needle into one of them and remove tissue without harming them, uh, that would be suitable. And we could do that, you know, put an exciting PhD dissertation, that would be... Yeah, yeah. Um, I could ask the UC Davis lab up in Sierra Nevada College to see if I can get some because they're already testing one of the ones, although you wouldn't be able to use that one because A, they've been dead for a while, I think, and B, um, they might have pestilence in them, so that wouldn't be a good baseline anyway. But. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's work on it. Let's get something going. Yeah, wrong. okay, perfect. Yes, well, this is an example of the kinds of possible collaborations and cross-disciplinary discourse that we encourage here at the Enlightenment Salons. And it's interesting too, in the year 2018, we have advanced far in terms of our scientific knowledge, but still not far enough. And there are so many common areas of life and of the world about which we know surprisingly little. And Bill, as you mentioned, the serious study of lifespans of any non-human organisms really began in the mid-19th century. And many of the longest-lived organisms were born before that time. So uh, even not enough time has passed to truly uh, ascertain the maximum lifespans uh, of which those species are capable of. I read recently there were studies of Greenland sharks showing that they could live to 400 or 500 years. And they don't never get cancer, you know, which is also you know, just correlated with telomeres. So I think the sharks, or several species of sharks have been some of the fish that I was talking about that um, <clears throat> have been shown to have telomeres producing all their cells in the telomere shortly. Mm -hmm. 
the sharks were previously already known to be very cancer resistant. And so a lot of products right now are shark extracts that people take to try to fight their cancer. Um, they work, and I would be surprised if they work, because we humans are so different from sharks, but at least the mechanism of action would help us design um, better ways to do it. And if it's just lengthening the telomeres, shoot, I'm already doing that. <laughs> so. Yes, and wouldn't it be nice to have an entire society where gaining that kind of knowledge is seen as a priority for the culture, just like we learn in elementary school, what are the planets of the solar system? How do you do basic arithmetic? Who were the presidents of the United States or famous historical figures in uh, whatever country we happen to be brought up in? Wouldn't it be great in basic educational systems to have lessons on lifespans and what are the lifespans of various organisms? What do we know? What don't we know? Uh, how can humans uh, potentially use this knowledge to live longer and healthier? I wish I had had that kind of education, but it, I didn't need it because I was so focused on it anyway that it would have really moved me ahead forward. You know, the big problem with uh, schools and for younger children and stuff like that is they don't emphasize healthy lifestyles. Uh, and uh, that's, you know, your, your lifestyle begins when you're um, uh, a child. Okay? And even uh, Sandra Kaufman's book that I just mentioned talked about the number of fat cells that a person has in their body changes with your lifestyle up until you're about, I think she said, 13 years old. Then it stops. Then you're, that's the rest of your life you have the same number of fat cells oh, and really? never changes. I mean, here's a reason why people might be wanting to focus more on lifestyle of the younger kids. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of that book of Sandra Kaufman. So that's yeah, uh, true. And you guys got to read it. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting too. One of my distinguishing projects in the field of life extension activism uh, has been Death is Wrong the illustrated children's book on life extension, and I try to inject a bit of that early childhood education by discussing long-lived organisms, and I do mention uh, the bristlecone pines and Turritopsis dornii jellyfish, which are dissimilar to humans, but the point that I make is, if these organisms are capable of having these lifespans, then there's not some immutable law of nature that says no organism can, uh, that humans cannot uh, for whatever reason. Uh, that is to say it's just a matter of figuring out our biology and how to control it and how to prevent the damage that occurs uh, over the course of a lifetime. But if more kids were exposed to those ideas, and we're interested in doing further research, the entire field could advance dramatically. I think if there were an updated edition of Death is Wrong published today, I would include expanded content, including, for instance, a mention of the Greenland sharks, as well as research advances that have been made over the past five years. And I think if children were motivated to find out more about this, uh, we could see a cultural shift. We see better lifestyles, and we could see better scientists, and we could see a better, just all around the world in the future. Yeah, and you know, John, you're a pioneer in this area. With yeah. that book that you've written, it's like, I don't know if anybody else has ever written a book like that, but I would encourage you to write more books on the subject as soon as possible and get them um, more used at, at schools and stuff. So, so I think it's very important. And we'll see if I can help with that, I will. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, I'm honored by your good words and by that offer, and definitely something to explore in the coming years. It's interesting, too, because this field keeps rapidly evolving. So new startups get formed, new research breakthroughs get announced every year and even in animals that are dissimilar to humans like mice uh, scientists are finding ways to uh, reverse the symptoms of certain diseases and to lengthen lifespans 
one of the things that could help, I think, is to have more purely lifespan-oriented studies on any organisms, including mice. Uh, what I see in some of the recent studies is there is this cutoff point, so scientists will say, well, we prefer staging, but then they don't monitor the mice after the cutoff point. What if they continue to monitor them? Well, th there are studies where they have monitored all the way until the mouse died. Maria Blasco and Ron Pennell both did that, even though they did have to sacrifice a few of the mice to look at the brain, <laughs> they cut up to cut a head and pull at the brain. But uh, they did let them go until they, they died and recorded the day, that they, the day that they did die. Now there's, there's one thing that a lot of people seem to overlook when they talk about mouse studies. And that's Richard Cutler. Dr. Richard Cutler published papers, I want to say 40 years ago, on oxidative stress and stuff. And they found out, he found out that humans have 100 times the level of ox, uh, um, superoxide dismutase as mice do. It's a hundredfold higher. <clears throat> and so humans don't actually have the oxidative stress problems that mice do. And, uh, and that's why mice tend to succumb to oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. So another subject that I would like us to venture into in light of recent events is that of privacy and in particular data privacy, which will become increasingly important. There was a recent major Facebook breach where essentially there was a vulnerability in the view as feature where you could view your Facebook profile as a friend or a member of the public and see what they would see. But apparently that feature had a loophole in it where an external party could use the view as feature to actually access somebody else's account, access somebody's private account information. So I was actually one of the people who Facebook had automatically logged out as a precaution. <clears throat> and essentially, it was a good idea at the time to reset one's password and make sure that if one's data had been accessed, uh, that the hackers couldn't log back into one's account. Then, very recently, Facebook published a feature on its help center saying uh, what data it suspects might have been accessed from one's own account. And I saw that yesterday. Fortunately, none of my private information was accessed according to Facebook, so they logged me out as a precaution. Uh, but I encourage others t to take a look, especially if they had been logged out in the past. There was also an announcement recently by Google that a, in the Google Plus social network, they had inadvertently allowed some of the developers of uh, the applications that use Google Plus to access people's private profile information. And generally, that would be information like names, email addresses, locations. Uh, not financial information as far as they're concerned, and they're not aware of any actual misuse of that information, but because Google Plus has struggled to acquire as wide of a user base as Facebook, they essentially used that disclosure as an excuse to announce that Google Plus was shutting down. Uh, and I don't think that's quite their genuine reason for shutting it down, but suffice it to say these data breaches have been happening quite frequently, and they have been high profile, and they have resulted in a lot of adverse public reaction to the point that a severe enough data breach can bring down a social network. And that speaks to the importance of protecting and safeguarding individual privacy, something that the Transhumanist Party strongly stands for, because as we increasingly utilize connected devices, connected computers, phones, smart home uh, devices, sensors, in the future that's going to be an even more significant part of our lives. If we have devices embedded in our bodies, 
medical devices, for instance, or uh, devices that could enhance our uh, brain function. What Ray Kurzweil, whom I interviewed at Bradfest, was talking about, the uh, neurocortex in the cloud, there are going to need to be extremely good safeguards to make sure there is no unauthorized access to tools that essentially become vital, literally vital, to the functioning of human life. So this is an ongoing discussion, of course, but uh, I would be interested in all of your thoughts about individual privacy and data ownership and how we can move from the status quo to a world in which people don't have to worry about somebody illegitimately acquiring their most private <clears throat> details. Um, I guess I'll start. Um, now, this, it's, it's very complicated depending on what's possible because while there's been a lot of preliminary work such as being able to be able to identify what people are thinking about, not necessarily exactly what, but a certain concept with some consistency, there's no real data on whether or not it's actually possible for a full brain uplink yet, or something like this. So, that one I will put my preconceptions aside besides the fact that I do not want my brain hooked up to the internet, at least not directly, at all, to the side until more data affirms it. But when it comes to data privacy, like, say, personal rights things, I'm an absolutist on the subject, meaning that they, they should have to disclose what they're doing with your data, where they're putting your data, or you should be able to say, hey, I don't want you to use my data. And whether that doesn't allow you to use the site, that's totally fine, but it yeah. should be completely, what's the word I'm looking for, transparent with this. Like, it's why I deleted my profile with 23andMe, because I did that like a few years back and got the raw data, but after a point, I'm like, I'm hearing some of these breaches and things like that, it's like, no, so did deletion, and I'm still two years away from them actually deleting it because there's some archaic law that, that had to do with the Human Genome Project that was passed in like the late 80s that said you have to keep your data for like four years. They pointed to it, and I'm like, crap. But um, uh, after that, I'm going to be very, very cautious going forward with my personal genetic data. Oh, indeed. Indeed. Now, uh, I'll point out, when Google Plus announced its impending shutdown in about 10 months, they also linked users to a site, a service they have called Google Takeout, where it's possible to actually export to your computer in a zip file or multiple zip files all of the data that Google has on you uh, across multiple services. So I actually did that in preparation for the shutdown of Google+, Plus, because I didn't want to lose my content. I don't post anything particularly private or sensitive on Google+, Plus, but I've posted a lot of links to articles and videos, a uh, few pictures over the years, and I don't want to lose that. Maybe now that I have all of that information, I could recreate it on my own website and have an archive of my Google Plus activity uh, just so that that is not lost simply because of a decision by the platform. But Bill, I know you had some thoughts on individual privacy. I, I just, I, for years I've had this feeling that someday in the near future, we are not going to have any privacy. <laughs> I agree. We're, it's, it's something, that I think that's what the world is evolving in that direction. That, that we're going to be knowing everything about everybody. And I think we're going to be really surprised to find out how common certain traits are that people yeah. are usually keep quiet and stuff like that. And things are going to be, it's going to be a whole world change. There's going to be people accepting things that they didn't accept before because it turns out 90% of the people were doing it anyway. You know, I don't know, can't even think of an example where I have to my head to describe it. It's, I just think we're going to have to face the fact that in, in the future, there is not going to be any privacy. I, I, I agree with you on that. Now, at, the, at the present point, mm -hmm. though, let me just say that before you start, I I don't put anything in Facebook that's not published even on my website. 
So like <clears throat> my phone number and my email address are in my Facebook post uh, profile. But there are also big letters on my website. So so it's uh, but you know so I'm not worried about anybody. When I, when I got when I was when they shut my account count down and I had to uh, restart it, I wasn't worried at all about anything I stole from my Facebook site. Uh, I was gonna say because like. In in the beginning, everyone kind of like lived together. There really was no like privacy a long time ago, and there was privacy, and now it seems like there's going to be no privacy again. It's like it goes back to what it was. Uh, yeah, I don't see the security getting any better at preventing these breaks. I just see them happening more and more and more. And yeah, essentially, you like look at someone and like there'll be like through your eye lens and like do, 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 all this stuff about him. The the, the biggest concern I have is when we we're able to like read. Like read each other, people being able to read your thoughts. That's a little. Uh, that's I an can't that's, wait. I can't wait. I, I, don't, I don't. I don't know about that. Adapt to it. I mean, I don't. Like, I, don't I just don't oh. know. But I don't know if that should be uh, one of the are, other people's autonomy. You, know? you sound like people twenty years ago when the World Wide Web was first being created. People said they didn't want to have anything to do with it. It'd be too complicated. We'd be communicating too much. There was going to be yeah, too, mostly too too difficult to do. Now we can't live without it. I mean, yeah, I know it'd be cool to like think instead of having to speak, but then like, you know, the per for a person to know your every thought is kind of like, if you're able to think through your thought, think what you want to say and put out there. So it's just kind of, it's an autonomy I'm not ready quite to give up. Self-driving car is going to like... It's not going to be comfortable at the beginning, but we're all going to get... Yeah, I know, yeah. I know. I'm just saying. I'm yeah. resistant. because so A self-driving car can see like a bee. Like, those things can see like everything. Once they're everywhere. I can't like, wait for them. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that, even, that's fine. I heard uh, Robert Friedas, uh, you might uh, know him. Yeah, I, know. I, know Robert. Uh, I watched an interview with him and uh, Ray Kurzweil, and uh, he's discussing about uh, privacy and um, hacks with really advanced nanotechnology. And he said something really interesting, which was uh, we're going to need to get rid of privacy. Uh, really, that's the only way to prevent um, these sort of hacks oh, yeah. or uh, dystopian futures with nanotechnology because. Um, you're going to need these things everywhere, in, in trees and inside uh, cars and inside our uh, human tissue um, to, to have mass surveillance, to, to make sure that there's no sort of um, uh, you know, uh, dystopian future with nanotechnology. So I have but a bit of a different perspective, and this is actually itself a dystopian future. <laughs> yeah, this, you can definitely see what that's wrong. Uh, but it, I just, that's what I heard him uh, talk about, and I think it's, uh, it's really important. Uh, it's, it didn't sound like something he necessarily wanted. It, it sounded more like something that just was necessary uh, for life to exist with that type of technology. But, so uh, no, no. this is a, a point of disagreement between me and uh, Zoltan Istvan, uh, who founded the Transhumanist Party. Uh, when he was chairman, he made certain statements about the disappearance of privacy in the future, but uh, since I became chairman, we adopted a platform plank essentially emphasizing our support of individual privacy, and at various conferences uh, since we've crossed paths and we've had that conversation, uh, also in the discussion was uh, Jose Cordero, who uh, took a bit of an intermediate position, but uh, Zoltan also articulated the view that he thinks privacy is becoming obsolete. Uh, I articulated the view that we need to figure out stronger protections for privacy in the technological age, not rejecting any of these technologies or ways to become interconnected, but really emphasizing the absolute individual ownership of data and the fact that while we may disclose more about ourselves than we would have in the past, we need to be the individuals who have that discretion, who choose to disclose or not to disclose, because different people are comfortable with disclosing different aspects of their lives, so it's not going to be one size fits all. But I think privacy in the future is going to be modular in the sense that we decide, we own our data. And in many cases, we should get paid if somebody else uses our data for financial benefit. Yeah. Uh, the social networks certainly have made a lot of money off yeah. individuals' data, but what if every time they make money, say, by selling advertisements, we get a fraction of that revenue? And that could also affect individuals' incentives about what they're comfortable sharing, uh, because there would be uh, a much more concrete uh, benefit-cost trade-off that people could see. 
Uh, so it will certainly be an interesting future. And thank you, everyone, for sharing your thoughts today. Well, let me say, I agree with everything you said. Um, I just don't believe it's going to happen. I just believe that the future is going to be where all privacy is, is dawn. <laughs> <laughs> not that I not that I like the idea, but I think it's that's what's going to happen. So you see, Bill, uh, at least from the standpoint of my cultural upbringing, I very much belong to that sliver of time uh, when the privacy of the individual was uh, the default expectation, and it, it was interesting because the right to privacy. Uh, was first articulated in the late 19th century. Uh, Louis Brandeis had a famous article in 1890 about the right to privacy, the right to be left alone. And this very much emerged out of the norms of the Victorian era, uh, which had really moved societies toward uh, what we see as contemporary middle class life people living in single family homes, people having their home spaces distinguished from their workspace, uh, people having their realms of private thoughts which may be different uh, from what they choose to share in public. So I am very much culturally of that time and I would hate to see the advantages of that disappear. No, I, I, I agree. I agree totally. Now, these people that you mentioned in the 19th century, I don't think they, when they were done with privacy, ever envisioned what we're talking about now. Yeah, big data. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, back then, you could, especially if you were fairly well off, uh, be, say, on your estate, in your mansion, and yes, you could have servants, you would have people who would know certain mm -hmm. things about you, but they wouldn't be the general public. So you, you controlled who knew who didn't. Exactly, exactly. Well, and then there was Brave New World in 1984, and numerous governments seem to be using those as instruction manuals. Yes, and that is unfortunate, but uh, Huxley and Orwell were prescient in their own ways about anticipating the erosion of privacy. But I think the dystopias they wrote about don't have to pass. I do think it's up no, to that. us as individuals to affect that outcome through what we accept, what we don't accept, how we use technology, and the expectations we set society-wide for the use of technology, because we certainly want the benefits of interconnectedness, and if people want to share something, they should be free to share it with as many uh, others as are willing to uh, access that information. But at the same time, in the future, I hope we have a kind of hyper plural, uh, pluralism of individual lifestyles where those who want to keep certain things to themselves will also have the freedom to do that. In any event, thank you very much, everyone, for attending our Fifth Enlightenment Salon and for an excellent discussion today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.